When you look at things going around in the world and we are just a few years out of this pandemic situation that brought everything to a halt, and we see the unrest not only on the world stage, but the kinds of things happening in our own nation's capital. And we know that we're living in times unlike any that have preceded us. We have to wonder if we're living in the last days. And what I wanna to talk to you about tonight is what I'm calling the church age and the last days the church age, and the last days. Because I can say with certainty, yes, we are living in the last days. But I want to talk about it a little bit tonight. And instead of just using one passage of Scripture, we're going to be looking at a lot of different Scriptures. And I'll put them all on the screen. It might be hard for you to follow along. I encourage you, if you're not doing anything else and you're sitting near an open Bible, I encourage you to turn to the different scriptures that we'll be looking at. But uh, if not, the scriptures that I'll be quoting tonight will appear on the screen the way I like to have them displayed. And we're going to be focusing on this whole idea of the last days and, and, and what it means to be in the church age as part of the last days. I think this is an important topic for us to discuss because I, I believe it'll help us understand the times in which we live, looking through the lenses of the placement of God's church in this, in this epoch or era of history in his prophetic timeline. And this is an important uh, time for us to be thinking about what it means to be in the last days, as I do believe we are. So I'm going to start by turning to the book of Hebrews, where this reference to the last days is made. We're going to look at several other scriptures where these references are made to the period of the last days. And we're not going to look at all of them because there'd be too many for us to, to, to focus on. But in the first chapter of Hebrews, the author begins that powerful letter by saying, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. So you see in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 just the second verse in that letter he makes a reference to these last days and that God who spoke through prophets in former times has in these last days spoken by revealing his son Jesus to the world. So the author of Hebrews is clearly identifying the period of the last days as being identified with the coming of Christ to the earth. And similarly, the apostle Peter in, in the letter bearing his name, 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 19 tells his readers, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, and I've underlined it there, in these last times for you. So in Hebrews 1, it says that, that God has spoken in these last days through Jesus, his son, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he speaks of Jesus Christ, who although he was foreordained before the world was even created to come into the world, it was only in these last times, very comparable to the expression last days, that Jesus was manifested to us because he came from heaven to earth. And then... This exciting day of Pentecost, the passage that describes the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit after Jesus ascended to heaven, it's recorded in Acts chapter 2. And the apostle Peter stood up and was preaching. And uh, in describing the phenomena that were occurring on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit led Peter to go back to the prophet Joel in the Old Testament and attribute a prophecy of Joel to the occurrence of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And verse 16, he says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes, and it shall come to pass, said Joel, 
in the last days, there's that expression, says the Lord that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And I've just inserted there parenthetically where that comes from, which is Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. So these are just three examples, these scriptures, uh, Hebrews 1, 1 Peter 1, and Acts chapter 2, where there are references to last days and latter days. So it's very clear that the last days is associated with Jesus Christ being on the earth. So whether or not we can pinpoint an exact starting moment or a, a date on the calendar for what ushered us into the period of the last days, we can say that the New Testament uh, writers believed that Jesus Christ, his coming to the earth, is a part of the last days. So perhaps we summarize and say the coming of Christ to the earth to atone for our sins and to establish his church was the commencement of the period we call the last days. Now, we know that looking back across the 2,000 years since Jesus did come to the world, believers before our time have thought that they were living in the last days. Some of you can probably think about grandparents or great-grandparents who were people of faith, who were Christians, who who saw things happening in the world in which they lived. And you can remember them saying things like, oh, we're living in the last days. I've often wondered what people in the times of colonial America thought when uh, you know, their identity was linked to the British crown and the Church of England was headed up by the King of England. And then there was a revolution to break away from the crown and also from the established church. Maybe there were t people living in the times of, of colonial American life who thought we must be in the last days for all of this unrest to be uh, taking place. We know that some of the more religious and zealous people among the patriots believed that they were going to establish God's kingdom in, in the, the new formation of the United States. They probably thought they were in the last days. I also think about what it must have been like to live during the Civil War in our country when a brother fought against brother, as, it's, as the saying goes, and our nation was imploding as, as factions were destroying one another. I'm sure there were people who thought these must be the last days. And then what about just in the, in the last century with World War I that, that destabilized the nations of the world who engaged in that. And, and then, of course, World War II. And you know how World War II was concluded by the dropping of these two atomic weapons of mass destruction on Japan by our country. And we realized that we not only have the capability as mankind to push back evil, but we have developed the capability to annihilate human life on a level never before imagined. Certainly, people living back in the days of, of uh, the, the atomic bomb being dropped in World War II, and let's, let's not forget the atrocities committed by Stalin and Hitler against millions of Jews. People back in the previous century must have thought these are the last days for sure. But here we are, and it's 2023. And Jesus has not come back. All of these things in history have come and gone. And so we're still living in the last days. But, you know, it's more than the fact that, than that we're living in the last days. You and I are living in the age of the church. We are a part of the, the church age. And I was reading uh, earlier this week about uh, people... Uh, contending with, disagreeing with the use of that expression, the church age, because as a phrase, it, it doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture. Well, that may be true, but neither does the word Trinity appear in Scripture. But we certainly affirm the concept of the Trinity, even though that word is never used. So I affirm the reality of the church age, even though that phrase never appears. 
So I want to walk through some things about the church age tonight, if I may. And I pray this will be helpful for you. And I know it will be for those of you who are studious when it comes to matters of prophecy, but also for those of you who understand the role of God's church in this period of history. I, I, I believe this is going to be meaningful to you. So if you take the last days and tuck into the last days what we call the church age, I believe the church age is the largest component of the last days period. The church age occupies the biggest chunk of the time that we refer to as the last days. So if you stop and think about it, the age of Israel from when God chose Abraham to be the father of the nation until the Lord Jesus Christ came, that would be a, a period of, of 2,000 years from Abraham to the Lord Jesus. And, and then if you look at it from the time of Jesus until now, that would be 2,000 years. So already the church age in duration has has endured for the same period of time as the period from Abraham to Christ. So that is quite telling, is it not? That the church age has already lasted as long as the period of time from Abraham to Jesus. Then we know after the church age will come the tribulation period, which we, be, we believe will be seven years in duration, and then the kingdom of God will come to earth. So if, if you believe that the last days could be defined as the period of the life and ministry of Jesus, the church age, which is from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 until the rapture, and then the seven-year tribulation, there is no question. Jesus' life was 33 years. Tribulation's only seven years. The church age is 2,000 years and counting. So we know the church age is the largest component of the last days. And are we entering into the last period of the church age? I think there's enough indicator out there to say, yeah, most likely we are. As I said not too long ago, I think we're living in the last days of the last days or the latter days of the last days. So let's talk about the church age in significant and its significance to the last days. How can we describe the church age? Well, I'm gonna give you a series of statements that describe the period of the church. And, and the first one is, it's the time in God's plan when God is known only by those who believe in his son. It's the time in God's plan for humanity when God can only be known by those who come to him through Christ, only those who believe in the Son of God. So this is the period of time. It, it began with the, with the day of Pentecost. It has endured until the day that you and I are, are, are talking about this tonight and until the, the rapture. The church age is that period of time when people can only be saved through faith in Christ. Jesus said it in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The apostles believed that and put their lives on the line, and they preached it because they said in Acts chapter 4, when they were preaching the gospel, they said in Acts 4, 12, for there is salvation in no other name under heaven given among men except the name of Jesus. They said there is no other name by which men can be saved. So the church age is the time in God's program, God's plan for humanity, when he can only be known by those who believe in his son. All right, let me give you another description of the church age. And that is, it's the time when Jesus' followers are proclaiming his gospel around the world. That's what's happening during the church age. And this goes back to the last words he gave in the gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He said before he ascended in Acts chapter 1, just before he disappeared, and went back to heaven after his resurrection. 
he said, you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So the church age is characterized by the universal preaching of the gospel on the part of followers of Jesus. If you boil it all down to why the church is here for the church age, it is to proclaim God's glory in the earth by calling people to trust in Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel. That's what we do. And it's so easy in the church age for the church to get sidelined and distracted from doing what God has left us here to do, which is to lead people to Christ by proclaiming the gospel. Where we live, in our neighborhoods, our city, state, nation, and all over the world. And as I'm sitting here talking to you tonight, that is going on. And that's what we're doing even through this live stream. So the church age is the time when the followers of Jesus are proclaiming the gospel. But let me give you another description of the church age. It is that time that Paul called a mystery, something that was not revealed to the Old Testament prophets. So the word mystery is the word God gave Paul when he was writing about the reality of the church. He called it a mystery. And he didn't just call it a mystery, but he actually defined what he meant by the word mystery. You know, you and I think about a mystery as something that is unsolved, something that is confusing, something that creates more questions than answers. But Paul actually uses the word and then defines it in Ephesians chapter 3. So I want to read a few verses because remember, we're talking about the church age as part of the last days. The church is a mystery. He says in Ephesians 3 verse 1, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. I put it, I've underlined it there because he uses that word. He even says, I briefly wrote about this earlier. Verse 4, he says, by which when you read, he says, I want you to understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And this is where he defines it. Which in other ages, meaning before this age, before the church age, that mystery was not made known to humanity, to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And what is the mystery? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and I've inserted here, with Jews, the mystery is that Jew and Gentile will be fellow heirs of the same body. And that's the body of Christ called the church. And partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. All right. So one way to define mystery is something that was previously concealed but has now been revealed. He says that's the church. The prophets of the Old Testament did not foretell or even foresee the church. It was hidden from them. But he says here in Ephesians 3, God revealed this mystery, though he withheld it from the prophets of old, he revealed it to the apostles and prophets of new because they encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus established his church. This hidden reality of the Old Testament that is now a present reality in the New Testament. So something previously concealed which has now been revealed and the essence of the mystery is that Jews and Gentiles are now one in Christ, members of the same body of believers. So something that's really 
fascinating to me about the church is that the church of Jesus Christ and the church age, as we're talking about, it's the time when believing Jews, Jews who believe in Jesus, who are the remnant of God's chosen people, belong to the same body of believers with believing Gentiles. Jews who believe in Jesus, Gentiles who believe in Jesus together comprise the body of Christ. Even though when the church was first birthed, Jews who believed in Jesus far outnumbered Gentiles because the, the foundation of the church was, was of Jews. Uh, the apostles themselves and the first converts to Christianity was, were from among Judaism. But as we know, through the evolution of the church's identity in the book of Acts, all the way down to our day and time, Gentile believers in Jesus far outnumber Jews, but there are still Jewish followers of Jesus, as they say of Yeshua. We would call them Messianic believers. And there are still Jews who are coming to Christ who are Messianic Jews. And together with, with us Gentiles, it's the mystery they did not see coming in the Old Testament that has become a reality in the New Testament. The church age is when Jew and Gentile belong to the same family. Now, that is part of the glory of the church. And in, when the Apostle Paul was writing about that, what it means for Jews to believe in Jesus during the church age, he discusses it at length in the 11th chapter of Romans. He said in Romans 11 and verse 5, So then at this present time, there is a remnant, and I've inserted there, these are my words, a remnant of saved Jews according to the election of grace. So the Apostle Paul refers to Jews who believe in Jesus during the church age as the remnant who represent the people of Israel who have access to God because of their faith in Jesus. They are the believing remnant that God is honoring through the church age and whom God has made one with Gentiles to belong to his church. Now, some people would conclude from all the things that I just said about that, well, if God is saving Jews through faith in Jesus Christ and he is making them one with Gentiles through their faith in Jesus Christ and so now believing Jew and believing Gentile belong to the same body, then certainly God is finished with Israel as a people. He's finished with the nation of Israel. He's finished with the land of Israel. He is, there is nothing more that God has in store for the Jewish people apart from those Jews who are coming to Christ and who have come to Christ since the church was born. Well, I don't believe that. So I want to give you another statement that I think, uh, really, this statement I'm about to give you is a line of separation for believers in how we interpret prophecy. And here it is. While God is building his church, that's what you and I are part of, he is still accomplishing his unfulfilled purposes for Israel. So I want to read it again. While God is building his church, and he's been doing that since the day of Pentecost, while God is building his church, he is still accomplishing his unfulfilled purposes for Israel as a people. So this, this statement right here, because I believe this, this separates me from many Christians who don't believe this because they believe the church replaced Israel. You know, out with the old, in with the new. So there's a lot of disagreement on this. But this is an indispensable facet of understanding the last days and Bible prophecy accurately. And I, I think even understanding the identity of the church. Is this the basis for Christian fellowship? In other words, if someone disagrees with me on God's plan for Israel, am I going to say you're not a Christian? I'm a real Christian? No. 
I don't believe it's a basis for Christian fellowship, but it is difficult for me to walk very closely with people uh, who, who, who do not affirm God's purpose for Israel. I don't question their salvation, and I don't refuse to have fellowship with them in walking together as believers, but I cannot be completely at peace with believers who think God has just kicked Israel to the curb and he's done with them. Um, I believe holding out for God fulfilling his final purposes for Israel as he promised over and over and over again, um, I believe that's the only logical conclusion we can reach from a careful examination and a literal interpretation of his prophetic promises to his covenant people. So while God's focus is currently on his church, he has not forgotten about Israel and he is still accomplishing his unfulfilled purposes for Israel. Because of that, we can continue in affirming this about the church age. I hope you're bearing with me. We're talking about the church age, and now we're kind of shifting to say that while God's focus is on the church, he is still working among Israel to fulfill his purposes for them beyond the last days and beyond the church age. So the church age is a time when God is demonstrating to Israel the relationship they could have with him. They could have. For unbelieving Jews, they do not have a relationship with God in the way that we would describe as being necessary through faith in Jesus Christ. This has been a bone of contention. It was, it was a dividing line in the book of Acts. It, 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 it was combustible in the preaching of the gospel when all you have to do is look at what happened with the early apostles in Jerusalem. And, and look what happened to Paul when he went to the synagogues and preached the gospel. Um, there was this dividing line because these Jewish evangelists were saying to their fellow Jews, you've got to believe in Jesus now. And it didn't go over well with many people. And it still doesn't go over well today. But what God is doing today through the intimacy and the closeness he has with the church, he's using the intimacy he has with his church as a testimony to Israel about the intimacy they could have if they would trust in Christ. Now, where, what do I base this on? I base it on Romans chapter 11, where Paul says this, I say then, have they, and he's referring there to Israel, have they completely stumbled so that they should fall and we forget about them? And he answers that question, certainly not. But through their fall, in order to, look at this, in order to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So he concludes in verse 12, if their fall means riches for the rest of the world, and their failure means riches that have come to the Gentiles through salvation. He says, how much more their fullness? So he's saying, if the world has been blessed by the gospel being rejected by Israel and being sent to the Gentile world, the world has reaped great blessings from the gospel being preached to the Gentile nations. He's saying, how much more will this world be blessed when Israel believes the gospel. Oh, that's powerful, isn't it? But did you notice he said in verse 11, God is using the church to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, we don't like speaking of jealousy. Jealousy is such a negative word. And that's why I'm saying God's using his church just to show Jewish people and Israel as a whole the relationship they could have with him, which the church now does have with him. God is accomplishing this through the church age. We know this is a temporary situation. For instance, in the same chapter we just looked at, in he, uh, Romans chapter 11, Paul goes on to say, um, 
For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. There's that word again. Lest you should be cocky or arrogant in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So that little adverb, until, tells you that there is a ticking clock on the age of the church. And he says, one day, the fullness of the Gentiles will reach its completion. And at that time, God is going to refocus on a relationship with Israel. And they will come to him through faith in a Messiah who returns to their land. <laughs> and again, that's looking into prophecy. But I look at these verses and I ask, how can you read even the writings of Paul in Romans 11 and conclude anything other than the fact that God still has a plan for Israel? I don't understand it. I, I want to be kind about it, but I don't understand it. So what we're saying is this church age is a time when God is showing the Jewish people they can have the relationship that the church does have with him, but it requires them coming to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's something else. The church age is the time when God is regathering the Jewish people to their land. Again, his focus is on his church. We are the body of Christ. Jewish believers in Christ, Gentile believers in Christ, partakers of the covenant promise, and members of the same body of believers, yes. But while we are relishing our intimacy with him and while he is lavishing his grace, favor, and intimacy upon us, he's still doing a work over here in Israel. And if you think about it, the nation of Israel as an entity really went into extinction in the year 70 AD, which is roughly 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. The Romans came in, destroyed Jerusalem, and the Jewish people as, as a national entity were no more until 1948. So throughout the entire church age, God had scattered the Jewish people into the far reaches of the earth, but then he started regathering them to their homeland and they reconstituted as a nation in the middle of the 20th century. Are you telling me there's no significance to that in God's prophetic plan? Oh, there is absolute significance to that in God's prophetic plan. And among the many promises God made to the Jewish people, going all the way back to Moses in what was written in Deuteronomy and extending to the latter books of the Old Testament and the writings of the prophets, God promised them, yes, I will judge you and scatter you, but I will regather you over and over. I will scatter you. I will regather you. So one such promise is found in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 17, where God says to Ezekiel, Hey, Ezekiel, say this. Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. That's one of the most succinct versions of that promise that I could find to share with you tonight. So this isn't referring to the time when they would return from the exile in Babylon that came about, uh, you know, in the 6th century before Christ because they came back from exile in Babylon only to be scattered again in 70 A.D. I believe this promise of Ezekiel, which you can find in Isaiah, and you can find it in Jeremiah, and you can find it in Zechariah, and you can find it in Zephaniah. This promise to bring them back to their land and give that land to them, I believe it's referring to a scenario in which once placed in their land by God again, they will never again be scattered or uprooted or separated from the land that God swore to them through their ancestor, Abraham. So it's during this church age and towards the end of the church age as we know it that God 
has been bringing these Jewish people back to their covenant land, sworn to them by promise and oath of God. They've reconstituted as a nation, and there they are thriving. They're not without complications, controversies, conflicts. They're not without turmoil in their government. We see all the things happening there. And they are not restored into God's favor as the church is through faith in Jesus Christ, but they are being positioned for restoration. That's the point. And so this is what's happening during the church age. Let me tell you something else that, that we can say to describe the church age. The church age that we're living in right now is the time when God is allowing the global consolidation of power, which will be the platform of the Antichrist. It's the time when God is allowing the global consolidation of power, which will be the platform of the Antichrist. You know, um, we've, I've preached this a good number of times before, but what the citizens of what we call ancient Babel in the book of Genesis, you remember when they were trying to build that tower that reached up to the heavens and they had no divisions, they were united culturally and by a common language and God confused them by scattering them according to language confusion and all of a sudden they couldn't understand each other anymore. But it was a, a prehistoric look at the end times kingdom of the Antichrist. In the same way they were consolidated and unified in their, in their commitment to secular human power apart from God, so the kingdom of the Antichrist will be a consolidation. And although people still speak different languages, it's during this latter part of the church age that God is allowing there to be a consolidation of the sea of humanity. And uh, I have another message I'm working on talk about how this is happening. It is happening through technology. And of course it is happening through um, global dogmas and philosophies and an interdependent global economy and so many other things. But especially technology. So I want you to think about it. When John saw the beast in, in, in Revelation 13, which we believe the Holy Spirit revealed these things to John using the same kinds of imagery that uh, were revealed in the prophet of Daniel, in the prophecy of Daniel. But just to kind of narrow the focus a little bit, one of the things that John saw about the beast in Revelation 13 who is this human leader called a beast, it was revealed to John that this man was going to be all-powerful on planet Earth. And this is what he said about the Antichrist, who, whom he called the beast. In Revelation 13, 7, it says this, And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, that is a very simple, concise sentence that really is a snapshot of the, of the Antichrist and the power that he will have. He will have authority over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Well, that is the culmination of what I'm calling global consolidation. So it's during the church age that while all these things I've said about the church age are true, People can only know God through faith in Jesus Christ. The followers of Jesus are preaching the gospel and extending his glory throughout the earth among the nations. And all the things he's doing to prepare Israel to, to be restored unto him. Everything we've talked about. In addition to all those things, God is allowing the satanic influence around the world to unite the global population along certain lines, and all of that is going to give the Antichrist the platform that he will use 
to exercise control and coercion and ultimately persecution over all the peoples of the earth. And in the same chapter of Revelation, John even says that everyone on planet earth at that stage in the tribulation will worship this human leader as though he is God. This human political leader will be worshiped although he is a mortal man. He'll be worshiped by all except for tribulation believers, those who will have been saved during the tribulation, who are described as those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, so we've talked about so much today. The last days, are we living in the last days? You better believe it. It started with Jesus coming to the world. The church age was launched after his resurrection when he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. One day the church will be raptured and then God's plan for Israel will resume. Yes, we're living in the biggest part of the last days and we could argue the case we're in the last part of the last days. So what do we do while we're agreeing we're in the last days? Well, we keep studying the Bible. We keep learning prophecy because we need to know where the world is going. But our passion, our heartbeat, our energies, our effort, our desires must be devoted to seizing this moment that we're in. The church age will one day pass and the church will be taken out of here. We have limited time to fulfill God's purpose for the church, which is to glorify him in the earth by sharing the gospel with every human soul. Every man, woman, boy, or girl on planet Earth in our lifetime. And you know, I am really committed as a follower of Jesus and as pastor of this church. I want to do everything I can to position our church to continue doing that far beyond my lifetime if Jesus should delay his return, if he should tarry before coming back. So what we've got to do is devote our lives to God's cause and to the church we need to pledge our love to the church. We need to pledge our service. We need to pledge our money, our resources, our everything that we have that's been entrusted to us by God. We're living in this time, and we have been appointed by God to live at this day and time in the church age, even if we're on the tail end of it. It is time for us to, to put money in the game and to, and to be all in for the church of Jesus Christ, because this is our time. This is our age. No matter what's happening in our world, God put us here for this moment. So my question before I pray is, are you just on the sideline watching other people do things for God? Are you on the sideline watching other people give and, and, and sacrifice for the Lord and for his work? Are you on the sideline when it comes to sharing the gospel and being involved in getting the word of God out to people? Or are you on the front lines taking your place, saying, I'm saved. I belong to this church. I want to do my part in the church age to share the gospel before the sun sets on this glorious era of God's church. And then God restores Israel. You and I come back. We're in the kingdom of God. We can't do then what we can only do now. The time is now to take your place in the age of the church. Father, I thank you so much for allowing me to share tonight with your people, for all who are watching. I thank you for the excitement you are rebirthing in me for our church and for your church in our country and our world to rise up, to seize this moment, to be your people who are called by your name, and to be all in for the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.